Good evening, everybody. I'm Mogram Post, the founder of Brash. survivors and thrivers to eliminate the feeling of isolation and help you feel whole again. During COVID-19, we're sending out packages to different women who are starting either surgeries or treatments. If you or your family member knows anybody that is in need, please reach out to myself, Kate or Tammy, one of our board members. We'd love to get a package out to you. As well as our mission at Rock is Strong is to fund women post mastectomy garments, which is part of helping us feel whole again as we go through a journey. So if you know somebody in need of a post mastectomy garment or a lymphedema sleeve, you can feel free to reach out to us and we'd love to give them our Tonight we have a special guest We'll go ahead and have everybody do their short introductions and then we'll pass the mic over to Dr. C. Thank you so much for joining us and dedicating your time to helping the community know their options as I'm a true advocate of knowing your options, knowledge is power, no matter you know, you see a doctor, you're unsure of if it's the right choice or if you're moving forward in the right way. You know, there's different options out there for different women and different surgeries and different surgeons in general. And I want you guys to know that these resources are available at Braca Strong as we keep them on our fingertips at all times throughout our country as Dr. C is from Texas. So what I'd like to do is start with our first member, Tammy. Good evening, everybody. I'm Tammy Ayan. I'm a BRCA Strong Board member. I'm a two-time ovarian cancer survivor, and I did a, a deep a nipple sparing, deep flap, latissimus dorsi flap um, reconstruction that had numerous complications. I'm exactly a year out from surgery, still totally numb, um, and I'm here to to learn how to proceed and, and care for myself and to support my cousin who is here with us tonight. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, let's see, Retta, do you mind doing a short introduction? <laughs> hey, I'm Loretta. Um, I just found that I was uh, stage one, uh, I guess, breast cancer. It's scary, it's, you know, it's nervous and I found you guys and, you know, I like you guys. It's, let's see where we go. <laughs> Perfect, thank you for joining. And again, if there's anything we can do for you, please let us know at any time. Kate? Hi, I'm Kate. i um, a provider, BRCA. I don't even know if it's one or two, whatever. But I did all my surgeries. Um, found Tracy when I found out I had BRCA. I've been part of BRCA Strong with her since then. Doing fashion shows and good events, but with COVID, it's all these Zoom calls. But we help everyone. We sell, send packages all over the U.S., and we're here for everyone. So. Thank you, Kate. Wendy? I am Wendy. I'm from Chicago. My cousin's here. And uh, thank God because she's the one who brought me to Brock Strong. Um, I found out a little over two months ago, I was stage one cancer, breast cancer, and also obviously BRCA1 positive. Um, and I've just been, you know what, I'm so grateful to have this you know, support system in my life because I'm losing it. Girls, I'm losing it. <laughs> but I'm going to get through it. I'm going to get through it because of you all, you know. Um, yeah, that's about it. Yay. <laughs> Toby. Toby. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Tracy's mom. I've been watching her journey since she's 18. And I retired just about six months ago and decided to help her build this bracket strong with these incredible women <clears throat> and take it to just another level. They've all been unbelievable with Tracy. I thank you. Kate, I thank you, Tammy, with all my heart and soul. And although I haven't been on a bracket journey, I am on my own journey. But I wish I had the support that all of you have because you could reach out to each other at any time and watching all of you helps me as well. So thank you, thank you, Dr. C. I, listen, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. and Maybe I'll come to Texas and visit. <laughs> um, Jay and Wendy, best of luck. You've got the best support team that you could possibly have. Thanks, Toby. 
You're welcome. I'll mail you chicken soup. Oh, <laughs> please do. On dry ice. Okay. <laughs> J&T. Sorry, I don't know your first name. Somebody has a login with J&T. Yeah, sorry. My name's Jessica. Um, I actually saw this event, uh, I think, on Dr. C's Instagram. Didn't realize it was part of the BRCA strong. I actually have a different genetic variant, um, a less common one. In fact, a less, a less common version of a less common one, one of the Czech 2 variants. And I learned that three years ago, and then in December was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, had a lumpectomy in February and a month of radiation in June. Um, and just started tamoxifen yesterday uh, for the next five years. But um, expecting that given the high chance of a recurrence of breast cancer, or perhaps high chance of anxiety at every MRI I'll be going to every six months, that uh, it's quite possible a deep flap is in my future. Well, thank you for joining. And just for everybody that's on the call, I do want to run something by that. Yes, we are called BRCA strong. When I started it, you know, I was BRCA positive, but our group is open to breast cancer survivors. You do not have to carry the gene and different mutations. Obviously, we work with and support as well. So I just want everybody to know that because a lot of people are like, well, we have to be BRCA positive. No, we're here to support everybody on their journey. Mary Beth? Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mary Beth, and I am BRCA1 positive. Uh, found out at the end of June, and uh, I'm in the middle of interviewing surgeons to uh, start the journey. So I'm based up in Chicago, and uh, just here to learn about what I uh, should be asking, things that I should be thinking about. I've had two consultations already, both of which were vastly different recommendations. So uh, a little confused at this point, but hoping to learn some stuff here. And thank you guys for putting it together. And uh, Dr. C, nice to meet you. Likewise. Thank you for joining. And if you want Mary Beth, she got the message. I won't be more than happy to make sure that we connect with you and get a package in the mail to you. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Perfect. You're welcome. Erica? Hi, everyone. I hope you guys can hear me. I'm having a little bit of an issue with my internet connection, but I'm actually um, here to learn on behalf of a family member who um, has just found out they are BRCA positive. So someone sent me this on Instagram, actually. So um, yeah, I'm here just to learn everything I can. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you for joining. I it's great to hear that supporters are out there. Obviously, as you know, in our journeys, we want to make sure we're not alone. You can also check out our YouTube channel, Erica. There's all of our lectures and physicians that speak. So you can always hear any of the lectures. And Dr. C will be on there by tomorrow afternoon. Oh, amazing. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Um, Marcelo? Or Mauricio? Mauricio. Mauricio or Marcelo, are you guys on? We just want to do a short introduction to introduce who you are, please. You're trying to figure out the mute. Okay. What we'll do is we'll have Dr. C go ahead and introduce himself. Thank you again so much, ladies, for joining, and Dr. C for dedicating your time to coming on tonight. Welcome. Thanks for thanks for having me. Great to meet everyone. Um, uh, so I'm a plastic surgeon. Um, I specialize in breast reconstruction. I'm also a big advocate for shared decision making, which is really key in making the best decision, I think, in my opinion, uh, in terms of treatment recommendations for patients. Um, there isn't one best answer for everyone, and uh, we're going to talk about that uh, tonight. Um, I'm, in, I'm in private practice um, with six other surgeons, shortly to be seven. We just hired someone else too. So uh, in San Antonio, uh, we all share the same passion, which is breast reconstruction, all techniques so I'm really very, very lucky. I have a phenomenal team um, around me, um, 
constantly trying to make me look good. So it's really, it's a really good situation. <laughs> um, so hopefully we can get your questions answered tonight um, about uh, breast reconstruction, um, irrespective of your uh, diagnosis, situation, background. So here for you ladies and, and gents, if there are any. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I think um, I think there's a lot of people here that are just really trying to understand the deep flap. There's a lot of confusion. Like I know I had my um, latissimus dorsi flap, which my surgeon offered me that option and didn't really discuss any other options with me. But everybody that I've met in the bracket strong community has done uh, the stomach. The I forgot what it's called, but you know, the flap from the stomach. So maybe explaining that option to people might be a good way to start explaining the difference between the two and well, how they're... Well, let me, um, if we're ready to start, uh, yeah. I've actually put a few slides together and then oh. I'll, I, I didn't actually, uh, the deep flap's actually what we specialize in. Um, so I could talk for about a day on deep flap. And so we can talk as much about that as possible. Um, and as much time as you have, and we'll get all the questions answered. <clears throat> Let me give like a kind of an overall kind of picture of, of the philosophy I think that's important for, for people to take away. And then we can get deep flap questions and any other question answered. So I'm just gonna share my screen. Can you guys see this presentation? Yes. Great. All right. So I'm going to talk about holistic breast reconstruction. Um, so uh, first of all, a little bit uh, about me. Um, as I said, we're private part of a big private practice group in San Antonio with seven of us. Um, we are known mostly for deep flap reconstruction because that's mostly what we do. Uh, we do a lot of them and have been doing them for many, many, many years, but that's not the only thing we offer. Um, there are other procedures uh, as well, and, and we perform all of them. We also specialize in lymphedema, uh, and we also uh, cater to women who uh, don't want reconstruction but uh, still want to look good going flat. Uh, we do have a new website, um, prma-enhance.com, and it's got all the options there as well and everything we offer. So please uh, visit, take a look. So what do I mean by holistic? Well, holistic basically means complete. Um, this decision is, a, is about more than just your breasts, right? So as plastic surgeons, we tend to focus on the breasts and how they look, but the, 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 the decision-making and really the conversation is way, way more complex, or at least it should be. So you guys obviously bring a lot to the table, um, your other, your diagnosis, uh, your other potential medical problems that you may have, diabetes, high blood pressure, previous surgeries that you know, may or may not influence what we're able to do in terms of reconstruction. What other treatment you may be getting, radiation can impact the optimal timing of reconstruction and, and also the type of reconstruction. Uh, <clears throat> social activities are important for us to know, you know, what is it that you want to get back to? Um, are you an avid golfer? Are you a rock climber? Uh, do you row? Do you run? Um, all these things that are important that, that really define you and your quality of life because this decision that you're making is all about really putting this behind you and moving on in the best possible way for you for your life and once we're done doing what we have to offer and putting you back together in whichever however that may look for you in terms of the decision you're the ones who are left with the consequences both good and bad. So we want to know what it is that you're getting back to or want to get back to. 
the other aspect of your social activities is your bad habits, like your smoking. Um, so that also influences the, the decision making. And, and what's behind your thought process? You know, how, um, how do you define uh, femininity? How does that look for you? Do breasts define you? Does, do your nipples define your breasts? Does sensation define your sexuality? All these things are really important, I think, in a proper, full conversation about uh, options when it comes to uh, reconstruction. Holistic also means the other parts of your life uh, and setting you up to have a very good result. And so things like your nutritional status need to be considered. Are you eating well? What kind of stuff do you eat? Are you eating enough protein? Um, <clears throat> vitamins A and C. Um, all these things are, are really important in setting you up. Um, and that's also part of an ARAS protocol an enhanced recovery after surgery protocol that we're going to talk about later. And ultimately, anything that you feel is important in, in your decision making is something that your surgical team should view as important in the, in the decision making. So what's important for one person may not really be important for another, but it's up to you to define that. So as you're going through the process, and even as you're listening and, and looking seeing this presentation tonight think about what's important to you and what your personal take-home message is so here's what we're talking about basically we're talking about a different type of decision making when i came through training i was taught in a paternalistic way so patient comes in doctor tells patient what patient should do um, that is basically just us expressing our opinion. That's not the way to do it. Um, and we also need to be doing a lot more than just providing information. Giving you a list of procedures and the potential complications isn't enough. What I'm talking about is a collaborative exchange of information, uh, and that's called shared decision making. And that's what the app that I created is all about, Breast Advocate app. Dot com. Please go download it. It's free. This is designed specifically to help you have the conversation that you want to have with your physicians so that you can get the information that you need to make the best decision for you. And what that basically means is the final treatment decision needs to be the sweet spot between your surgical team's expertise, what they're good at, what they think you're a good candidate for, what your goals and your preferences are, and anything else you've got going on, like your social structure, work, all those factors that I mentioned before. <clears throat> and the optimal decision is what's right in the middle. And you see the three circles. You want, you want the decision that intersects with all those three things. So, as I'm talking about this, you know, it should become apparent to you that, you know, you could have a, a, a pair of identical twins, same diagnosis, and a completely different surgical recommendation for each of them because they they value different things to different extents. So why is shared decision making important? Well. <clears throat> It leads to full education, and if a patient is fully educated and they know what's coming, then they're fully bought in. Patients who are fully bought in follow instructions. They have less anxiety. They are ready for any complications that may come across, that may happen. Um, they feel like they're part of a team, and it improves patient satisfaction, and it's shown to improve overall patient outcomes. And actually, that just doesn't that doesn't just apply to breast reconstruction. It's across all specialties, and it also helps patients actually advocate for themselves. Because if you don't advocate for yourself and express what's important to you, then you can't have a shared decision making treatment recommendation. I also wanted to talk about some myths that are out there before I actually touch on the procedures. So. The first one is that you've got to wait 
until after your mastectomy before you can have breast reconstruction. That's absolutely false for most women. There are some situations where it's probably safer to hold off, but um, until all your treatment is done, you know, if you're getting radiation, there are many surgeons that still advocate delaying your reconstruction until later, um, for example. But uh, if you have a gene uh, that increases your risk of breast cancer, if you've got an early stage breast cancer, the vast majority of women, as long as they're, they're otherwise fairly healthy, they can have immediate reconstruction, which is reconstruction at the same time. And it avoids you going through the experience of living without a breast if you don't want to. Um, myth number two, you can't have recon if you've had, or you will, or you will have radiation. That's absolutely not true. Um, it can impact the timing and it can impact the type of recommended, the uh, type of procedure that's recommended. Implants don't do that well with radiation. Tissue is a far better option if radiation is on the table. But for the vast majority of women, it doesn't matter if you're getting radiation or not, you still have reconstructive options. Myth three, I don't want implants. Implants are the only option, therefore I'm not getting breast reconstruction. Not true. There are several tissue options. The deep flap is just one procedure. It's the gold standard right now, but it's just one option. Most women are candidates for some sort of tissue-based reconstruction. So if you don't want implants, you don't have to get implants. Um, finally, you know, I don't think I want reconstruction, so I'm not gonna bother seeing a plastic surgeon. Why should I? False. Uh, plastic surgeons are, are very uh, involved uh, and should be very involved uh, in any conversation in, in a, for, for anyone really seeking a breast cancer surgical procedure. Uh, personally, I think women who are opting for a lumpectomy should have a consultation with a plastic surgeon. Um, there are oncoplastic techniques that many breast surgeons still don't talk about, unfortunately. Um, lumpectomy, uh, in, if you're lucky, a lumpectomy won't impact your breast too much. Um, but many times women look really good after a lumpectomy and then they have the radiation and radiation really kicks the scarring into overdrive and it can really impact the, the, the look of the breast and the breast symmetry. So, there are often times when plastic surgeons can help minimize the impact even of a lumpectomy. Um, for women going flat, uh, many of them have very unfavorable results because they're left with extra, extra skin, extra tissue. Um, they have significant contour issues with the chest and you know they go in asking to end up flat and unfortunately they end up anything but flat. Uh, so a plastic surgery consultation can really help uh, make sure that all the options have been considered and sometimes it can make a difference in terms of the result that you can get, even if you don't want reconstruction. So the most common type of reconstruction is it uses tissue expanders and implants. Tissue expanders is a staged deal. So you have a spacer tissue expander put in uh, either at the same time as the mastectomy or after. And it's gradually expanded over time using saline injections in the office. And then a second surgery is needed to remove the expander and put in the final implant. There are some ladies that are very good candidates to avoid the expansion process completely. And you can have the final implant put in at the same time as the mastectomy, which is nice. Unfortunately, the there's been a massive marketing kick with the direct to implant approach. Uh, it's being called, you know, one and done, uh, breast in a day. You know, I'm not a fan of those terms because there's a 30 to 35% chance that you'll need a revision procedure if you have the implant put in, uh, the final implant put in at the same time. So a third of women who are trying to be done and go, need more surgery anyway. So it's just something you gotta have your, you've gotta go in with your eyes open. 
In terms of uh, implants, they can be put in above or below the muscle. Um, typically, um, most surgeons still are putting the expander and the final implant under the muscle. Uh, there's uh, a, a mesh-like material called ADM, acellular dermal matrix. There are different companies, different products. Basically, that's used for extra support and extra coverage. Um, putting the expander and also, obviously, the final implant under the muscle provides more protection, but it also leads to an unnatural movement of the breast called breast animation, um, which many women find uh, very difficult to deal with, and they really don't like it. Um, so to avoid that, uh, we've, many of us have started putting implants on top of the muscle, and that's called the pre pec technique. Um, that involves leaving the muscle where it is. Uh, you don't have to lift it up to put the implant underneath or the expander underneath, so the surgery is less painful, and it completely avoids this animation that I'm talking about, this abnormal movement every time you use your chest muscle. The downside to putting it on top of the muscle is that it's more visible uh, for many women, especially if you're thin, and so you can see the ripples of the implant sometimes because an implant reconstruction is nothing like a cosmetic augmentation, okay? It's, it's not a boob job. So, uh, those of you going through this, you're going to have many well-intentioned friends from a position of love. They'll say things like, well, you know, you always wanted to be bigger. You know, at least now you're going to get the boob job you wanted. And that's really one of the worst things anyone can say because even if you're small breasted and don't have much breast tissue, if you're getting a cosmetic enhancement, you still have a lot more tissue there to camouflage the implant than after a mastectomy. So the two are completely different procedures. So with the, with the pre-PEC technique, when you put the implant on top of the muscle, it's very, very common for us to add fat injections um, under the skin to help increase the padding over the final implant and decrease the camouflage and decrease the visible rippling. Lots of different types of uh, tissue reconstruction uh, the deep flap now is, is the gold standard and it's been the gold standard for, for a while now, for many years. Um, that's evolved from the tram flap. The deep flap, the SIA flap, and the tram flap that you can see here all use the lower belly tissue. So the final scar is the same, hip to hip. What's different is what we do with the muscle and the blood supply. So the tram flap sacrifices your belly muscle, your, your abdominal muscle, your six pack muscle. If you're reconstructing both breasts, so both abdominal muscles are used, that can be quite debilitating. And you've got a, a high, a fairly high risk of having abdominal complications like bulging, or a hernia, and you also can't do a sit-up. Most women can't do a sit-up anymore. The other core muscles try to compensate, but removing both of your abdominal muscles is a big hit in terms of your core strength. Most women who are only having one breast reconstructed, most women tolerate losing one abdominal muscle quite well. The deep flap evolved from the tram flap it still uses the same skin and fat over the lower belly, but it saves all your muscle. So the vast majority of women are able to, do, to get back to whatever they want to get back to in terms of activities, and they preserve their core strength. The recovery is easier. But the SIA flap is similar to the deep flap. It just, we use different blood vessels. It's a different blood supply depending on the anatomy that you have. The SIA flap is even less invasive than the DIEP flap, but not everyone has the blood vessels that we need. 
to do the, the SIA flap procedure. The abdomen is the first choice for most of us in terms of reconstructing a breast. Uh, but if you don't have belly tissue or if you've had a previous tummy tuck uh, and you're not a candidate for, for a deep flap, then we can use thigh tissue. Um, we can use tissue from the upper back of the thigh. That's called a pap flap. That's underneath your buttock crease. Uh, we can use tissue from the inner thigh, which is called a tug flap. And there are various different combinations of that different uh, depending on the orientation of the scar um, and we can also use the saddlebag area from the outside of the thigh that's called an LTP flap that's not actually shown here but that's on the outside of the thigh um, and then uh, we can use tissue from the upper or lower buttock area that's called a gap flap and then the back is also a good option for many women uh, a latissimus flap or uh, other newer techniques that preserve the muscle. The latissimus flap takes the skin, the fat, and the back muscle underneath your shoulder blade and leaves you with a scar, preferably in the bra strap line, the horizontal. Um, the TDAP flap is a modification of that that saves the muscle. Um, but typically, we don't get enough tissue to reconstruct a large breast. A lot depends on the size of breast that you're, that you're starting with. Uh, other reconstructive options, uh, fat grafting, we use a lot in conjunction with all these techniques that I'm talking about to fill in little defects after the mastectomy, to feather out the reconstruction, um, to camouflage implants. Um, sometimes after a mastectomy, there's some hollowing that's pretty high up near the collarbone because the mastectomy can be pretty extensive. So we use fat injections to fill that in. And so we, have, we recreate a nice natural transition between the chest and the new breast. It's a very powerful tool. Some women can reconstruct the whole breast using just fat grafting. But if you do that, be prepared for multiple sessions of fat grafting. Um, and then also there are reconstructive techniques that we use to create an aesthetic flat closure for women. Um, so uh, most of the time, this is after an unfavorable result, uh, at least in my practice, most of the women I see are unhappy after going flat and they come for a, for a tune up to rearrange tissue, to fill in contour defects, to move tissue from the side, the kind of bat wing that many women are left with. Um, so there are lots of reconstructive techniques that we use to create a truly uh, flat contour for women who wish to go flat. The ARAS protocol that I mentioned earlier, so that stands for Enhanced Recovery After Surgery. So we're very big on this. We've been doing this for many years. Um, studies have shown that it improves uh, outcomes, patient satisfaction, it decreases narcotic use. So it really, it, it addresses every phase of the, of the surgical period, right? So before, during, and after. So ahead of time, we optimize your nutrition, like I mentioned before. Um, we uh, actually give you pain meds before your surgery. So you go in loaded with pain meds. So you have, you've got baseline pain control before we even make an incision. We do a lot of intraoperative pain blocks with local anesthetics. Those are injections of long acting numbing medicine that lasts for many days. And all these things decrease the need for narcotics as the, as the narcotics are only used in our practice for uh, breakthrough pain. So you have it, you have the narcotics if you need them. And by narcotics, I mean things like, you know, uh, Vicodin, Oxycodone, Hydrocodone, those, those sorts of drugs. Um, we depend on much more 
benign drugs for baseline pain control, Celebrex, extra strength Tylenol, low dose gabapentin. These things on their own, you know, people kind of wrinkle their nose. It's like, well, I'm going to need something stronger than that. But to be honest, the combination of those three drugs really sets the patient up for a very good baseline pain control where they don't need as many narcotics and many of our patients after they leave the hospital don't need many narcotics at all. The reason that's important is because you, narcotics can make you foggy. Narcotics can make you spaced out. They slow down your gut function so they can make you constipated. You don't want to be constipated after a deep flap. That's, not a good situation to be straining after a deep flap. Um, so what this ARAS protocol does is it removes the need to depend on narcotics. It gets your gut moving quicker. Um, it decreases issues like constipation. We get the Foley catheter out quicker. We get you out of bed quicker. You're walking quicker. And most of our patients now, we tell our patients, you're going to be in hospital for two days. So there's no ICU. Uh, we have a special floor. We have breast nurses. Uh, we have the set protocol, and it works. And people are in and out. So it's not this massive to do five days, ICU, a week in the hospital, all this stuff. It doesn't need to be that way. So... Really now we've moved on in terms of reconstruction, you know, many moons ago and still to this day, you know, you hear and you read about breast mound reconstruction. And I understand why we use those terms in our specialty. I don't like it though, because really it, it, it detracts because we're looking to recreate something a lot more than just a mound. We're looking to recreate something a lot more than just a bra filler, okay? So really breast reconstruction for us is viewed as having the same cosmetic expectations as someone having a mummy makeover. It has to be. And there's no reason why it shouldn't be. Now, not everyone ends up looking phenomenal. Sometimes there are other things that happen. There are complications. Radiation can have a huge impact, for example. I'm talking about the goal. Our goal has to be excellent aesthetic results because you're going to have to live with the consequences of these decisions, of your surgical decisions for the rest of your life. So, um, you know, I spoke a lot about tissue before and deep flaps, but you can get really good reconstruction results uh, with implants uh, if you have uh, the right team and if you have high quality mastectomy. So one point to take away is when you're picking your surgeon, if you want reconstruction, don't make the mistake of just picking the plastic surgeon do your research, pick the team. Because if that plastic surgeon doesn't routinely work with a small number of breast surgeons, then uh, you may not get the result that you, know, you could get because the mastectomy is key in setting, setting the stage. So this lady had right-sided breast cancer. We did a two-stage reconstruction. She got expanders first at the same time as her nipple sparing mastectomies. And then we changed out her expanders and put in the final implant. And we added some fat in the form of fat injections under the skin to improve the padding and, and to avoid the rippling. Um, this lady, she came to us after completion of her treatment. She'd had radiation after her mastectomy. You see the the, this, this color change here, this is the edge of the radiation. Radiation makes your skin more firm typically and it can change the color. Radiation's come a long way, but unfortunately we still can't control the biological response to it. You can have 
uh, two people, same diagnosis, same age, same skin tone, same medical problems, same everything, uh, but they react to radiation completely differently. One can have minimal changes and the other one can have really severe uh, scarring and fibrosis and toughening up of the skin. And so uh, it, it's very dependent uh, from patient to patient. So this lady, uh, you know, this is not a good candidate for an implant-based reconstruction. Putting in an expander underneath radiated tissue has a high risk of complications. Radiated tissue is very firm. It can be, it can be quite leathery. It's very hard to expand something that has that consistency. So in this lady, we basically introduce new, healthy, warm, soft tissue with a great blood supply from the belly. She had uh, a prophylactic or risk-reducing mastectomy on the other side, and she had deep flap to reconstruct both breasts. And on her right side, because of all the skin that was removed, she needs this big skin island, the skin patch, to allow us to provide, to recreate this nice shape. So in this situation, we prioritize shape over scarring because you really need that extra skin to recreate that shape. Uh, this is a lady that had an implant reconstruction elsewhere and, and you know, that doesn't look great and she wasn't very happy. And so um, she needed some extra skin again. And so this lady um, also opted for a risk reducing mastectomy on the other side and uh, deep flaps for both breasts. And that allowed us to introduce more skin into the breast here. Uh, that she needed to recreate the shape to match the other breast. Um, this lady had previous breast augmentation. Um, she was told that she wasn't a candidate for any procedures using her belly tissue because she was told she didn't have enough. Um, so again, you know, when you're picking someone pick someone who, and pick a team that does a lot of the procedure that you're looking for, right? So make sure they do the procedures that you may, that you think you may be interested in. And so here you can see, you know, this lady's uh, underwear has been pulled down to show you where the scar is, but there's no reason why you can't have nice aesthetic uh, result. This lady had bilateral skin sparing mastectomies she didn't save her nipples, she didn't want to. Um, I think actually on the right side, the cancer was too close to the nipple and the areola and she preferred to have the same thing done on both sides so she didn't save the other nipple either. Um, prophylactic mastectomy, risk reducing mastectomy on the left, deep flaps for both. No implants. This, whoops. Um, this lady, uh, gene mutation carrier, um, bilateral risk reducing mastectomies, um, nipple sparing, and immediate deep flap reconstruction. And um, this lady, uh, you know, she'd asked to go flat. Um, her result isn't. Uh, bad initially, but she was still left with, you know, extra tissue on the sides. Uh, the patients I typically see that are unhappy uh, have a lot worse contour issues than this lady had. She also had very thin covering over her ribs. And so she wanted uh, that addressed. So we just touched up her scars, removed the extra tissue on the sides and did some fat injections uh, to, to uh, improve the padding. Uh, and she was very happy with the improvement. The other thing that many people don't talk about is the numbness that happens after the mastectomy. And this was an article that came out in the New York Times, which was good and bad. You know, it was good because it really created discussion, much needed discussion about uh, sensation 
uh, and, and numbness after mastectomies. What was bad about it, in my opinion, was that it really, it, it, one of the messages that people took from the article was that it was a failure of the reconstruction. So even at our breast cancer conference, you know, I remember one of the breast surgeons turning around uh, after this was published, bringing it up at the beginning of breast cancer conference and saying, asking us, what are you telling your patients about the numbness they have? And so my response was, oh, you mean the numbness that you created with your mastectomy? I don't know. What did you tell them about your mastectomy and the numbness they were going to have? And so really, uh, this article was good because it really brought to the forefront and a very important conversation. And it was obvious that patients just weren't being told by breast surgeons or plastic surgeons. Breast surgeons weren't telling them that the mastectomies cause numbness. And plastic surgeons, when they would talk about reconstruction, they were limiting the conversation to how the breast looked and... You know, we would say dumb things like, oh, you know, the deep flap will, you know, it restores a natural feeling breast. Well, natural feeling to whom? So it, it was a very important conversation to have. Um, the other issue about numbness is not just the, the woman not being able to feel the touch on the breast. It's also a safety issue. Um, you, many women uh, have had, have suffered thermal injuries. Um, the number of times that, you know, some of our patients have been told by a friend or something, oh, just put a, oh, your breast is sore. Oh, just, put, just, just put a hot pack on it. Just put on, you know, so they'll, they'll get a, a wet rag, put it in the microwave, and then they put it on the breast, and then the breast skin gets burned. So don't ever put anything hot on your breast. If you're putting anything on your breast, if it's not tolerable on the inside of your forearm where your skin is really thin, don't put it on your breast, okay? Um, you don't have enough feeling most of the time after a mastectomy uh, to know that your breast skin is being burned. So we've been doing nerve reconstruction with our flap reconstructions for um, many, many years. It's uh, about 15 years, actually. And when we first started doing it, everyone thought we were nuts and they were, you know, but here we are now. Uh, now people are finally talking about it, so better late than never. So we have the potential to restore some feeling at the time of the reconstruction. So with many flap options, there are nerves that we can take with the tissue, and then we find the nerves that have been cut by the mastectomy in the breast, in the chest area, and we connect the two. Sometimes we add um, sometimes the two nerves will, will reach the nerve that we get with the tissue. Uh, sometimes it will reach the cut nerve in the chest. Sometimes we need uh, an extra nerve graft uh, to kind of bridge the gap. But there are, there are techniques that surgeons can use to restore uh, sensation now. What's interesting is the deep flap actually has the best uh, and most favorable nerve distribution. Um, and it has the closest nerve anatomy to the breast of all the flaps that we have available. Uh, Implant-based reconstruction though, you, you can also do nerve construction with that. The, an article was published about that very, very recently. Hardly anyone is doing it. In fact, only 5% of deep flap surgeons are doing nerve reconstructions with the deep flaps. So it really hasn't, it, it's, it's, we're still pushing for it. We're still talking about it. We talk about it a lot to increase awareness. Uh, but unfortunately, um, even though 
Oh, this is the article that showed that the deep flap is pretty close. So the, this number here, uh, basically, uh, this number represents the pressure that the deep flap can feel. And this is the pressure threshold for a normal breast. And this is the pressure threshold for a deep flap. So basically, it's similar. That's the take home message, pretty close. So anyway, so why hasn't nerve reconstruction taken off? Well, not many of us were trained in it, so it's kind of been teaching yourself, but as microsurgeons, we reconstruct nerves all the time and in other forms of reconstruction. So technically it's really pretty easy, uh, but we've always focused on aesthetics and uh, you know, successful reconstruction for us was uh, something that was technically beautiful and, and challenging and we would feel good about ourselves and, and, and it would look good, but really we haven't focused as a specialty on how it felt to the patient. Many surgeons turn around and say, well, patients don't complain. It's like, well, did you ask them? Not a good reason. Uh, some surgeons still don't think it works, but there's data now, there's plenty of data coming out to show that it does work. It's not gonna restore mother nature in terms of the level of feeling, not yet. Um, but it definitely has helped our patients in terms of return of protective sensation. And some of them even do have a little bit of erogenous sensation. But to be sure, if you have nerve reconstruction done, um, you shouldn't expect full return like it was before your mastectomy. Other surgeons feel that it increases complication rates. There's no evidence to show that. And also some don't do it because they feel that the nerve grafts, as I mentioned, sometimes we need an extra nerve graft for the two nerves to, to reach so that we can connect them. Those are expensive, but there's actually a way around that. You don't have to use nerve grafts. Um, this is just an article that showed that when you do the nerve reconstruction in conjunction with a deep flap, that women do have better long-term feeling learning compared to women that don't have the nerve reconstruction. Um, why is that important? Because ultimately it impacts your quality of life. So, uh, when you look at patient quality of life studies, we know that reconstructing nerves is worthwhile. And, you know, we get these all the time too. This is our Facebook page. If you uh, don't follow us on Facebook, this is the, the practice uh, Facebook page. Um, if you don't follow us, please do so. So we love posts like this, completely unsolicited. Six months out and I've begun recovering some sensation already. So so very happy this was available. Um, it works. So things for you all to consider. Um, some of what I've talked about will be important to some of you. Some of it won't be. So work out what's important to you. Get a list going. Write it down. What do you want out of this? What are your goals? Before you go into your consultation, do your homework, okay? Knowledge is power. Okay, so, but you can't advocate for yourselves if you don't know anything. You don't know if your surgical team is giving you all the options, if, you'd, if you've got no clue what the options are yourself. Unfortunately, there are surgeons who will not tell you all your options because they don't offer all the options. There you go, I said it. So, you have to advocate for yourselves, right? Download Breast Advocate. All the options are in there. Okay? It's not a Dr. C app. It's a patient advocacy app. It's for any practice, for any patient, anywhere. So please download it it's free. Like I mentioned earlier, pick your team, not just your plastic surgeon. Okay? The quality of the mastectomy can make or break your reconstruction. 
So if, what you want is you want a team that's cohesive, that works together all the time and has an understanding because they just get better results. It's just the way it goes. It's fact. And if your team doesn't offer certain procedures that you think you may be interested in, that's okay. Second opinion, you may not be a candidate for that procedure that you want, so it may not matter. But if in doubt, get a second opinion because it never hurts. And a, and a good surgical team, if you mention a second opinion, they should encourage it because they should want you to be comfortable. So anyone who tries to convince you not to get a second opinion, leave. So hopefully this, this will help. That's all I've got for you. Um, let's open it up for questions. Perfect. What I'm gonna do is, it does, if we can stop sharing this screen, if you can pull down for me, Dr. Steve, please. And then what we'll do is, guys, if you don't follow Dr. Steve, make sure you do. You can find all of his information as well as on our Brock Strong page. Um, thank you, Dr. Steve, so much for such an informative talk. I know um, it's imperative, again, to know your options. I'm gonna open up to discussion. What I'm gonna do is there's an area where you guys can raise your hand, if you can raise your hand, and then I will go ahead and call on everybody. And as we get started, Dr. C, is there any way we can have a copy of the ERISA for after surgery that you posted, the article that you did? How can I get a copy of the first one that you posted? Um, I'll um, share it on a google drive link awesome perfect thank you so much i'm interested in reading it and then i'm sure other women you know maybe we could figure out how we can get it up uploaded and share it with us yeah i'll send i'll send it to you perfect okay so let's start um jessica i believe you had a question uh, so my question is about um the need to maintain enough abdomen for lack of a better word flab to be able to create the breast tissue from it. You know, I, I was diagnosed in mid-December. I've put on, I don't know, maybe five, six, seven, maybe five or six pounds since then. I'd love to take that off just in the ordinary course, but at the same time, maybe I should keep it. Like, that, uh, that's my question. Yeah, you know, so without, without examining you, I don't know how many pounds you have to give up. Uh, the safest thing is not to worry about it. Focus on healthy eating. Um, you know, don't, even for ladies who, I mean, some ladies are told to gain weight because they really want a deep flap and they don't, they may, you know, the surgeon may feel they don't have enough, you know, but you've got to be careful with that because you don't want to eat junk. You don't want to eat crap. And, you know, you've got, you want, you want your nutrition to be tuned up. You've got to eat healthy stuff. Um, I wouldn't stress about losing weight right now because chances are your surgeon could use it. Um, I, I'm not sure I even can on tamoxifen anyway. I've heard that that's difficult to do. I just was curious. It is something hard I should, weight. Yeah, if should you're actively. Planning, yeah, if you're planning it, if you're planning a deep flap, uh, it, it kind of depends on, you know, how, on what you have, how you carry it. Um, you know, you may be able to lose five pounds, no problem, and it makes no difference whatsoever. But in some women, it, it can, you know. So it really is a very individual thing. Uh, I personally wouldn't be too hot to trot on dieting, losing weight in your situation right now. If you're planning a deep flap surgery, I would focus on quality of nutrition, um, rather than losing pounds. The ideal time to lose weight is actually after your deep flap. Most of us do or use a staged approach. So by that, I mean most of us like a secondary, a revision surgery. So you have your, your first, like in our practice, for example, the first surgery makes you physically whole. And then we do a revision surgery, an outpatient surgery, and that's the tune-up. And that's when we make you look as good as possible. So we set the stage for the best result at the first surgery, but we actually fine tune at the second surgery. 
anyone in your position, I would say if you're carrying a few extra pounds, if you are indeed carrying, you know, have a weight to lose, then I would do it between those two stages because then that maximizes the results of your revision surgery too. Some surgical teams, some places, they don't do a revision surgery and, they, and, and you, you get what you get in one surgery. Um, and I'm not saying you can't get a really nice result in one stage. You can, so it, but it, a lot it, of things need to go right. You're, so I'll just put everything that I kind of, more specific than I was being. If I'm doing this, I'm doing it with you. You actually do have pictures of me. <laughs> you just don't oh, have it matched. You just there's no there's no face with those photos. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> but I'm not planning to do it anytime soon because I did the radiation. I know that implants are not something I was interested in anyway, so that's not a problem for me. I've bought myself it feels like some time, and given the COVID situation, so this could be a year from now, two years from now, but, you know, I don't even know. Um, yeah. Hopefully I keep having nice, clear MRI results every six months in the meantime. Uh, and it just becomes a matter of my own anxieties and wanting to reduce my risk. But knowing that that's sort of potentially two, to, two years down the road for me to have the surgery, in that situation, it just seems like eat healthy and don't worry about the weight for this at this point. Yeah. Because if you eat healthily, you know, you, you may lose a few pounds, a couple of pounds anyway, right? Well, all I'm saying is I wouldn't focus on it being the main driver. Don't, don't, you know, don't get, don't stress out about losing the weight. The other thing about radiation, especially, and, uh, you know, I'm glad I don't remember your pictures because that would be really weird, you know. But, <laughs> um, I told my husband that I was talking to someone who has naked photos of me. He's like, yeah. what? <laughs> But, you know, if, we're, if, you, if you've had radiation, especially if you've had a mastectomy and then radiation, the amount of tissue that we need to reconstruct the breast is a lot more than you think in many situations. No, it, it, it's, it was a small Using lumpectomy. Lump, yeah, a small, so, a, okay, a quite small lumpectomy. Yeah. So as a, as a teaching point, though, um, I women who have had mastectomies and then radiation who have the question that you have, I would say absolutely not. Do, do not try to lose weight unless you're really heavy, unless your BMI is unhealthy. But if you're talking about a few vanity pounds, absolutely not. Um, yeah, no, no worries. There is a question. Do you know anybody in Chicago that takes the holistic approach that Dr. C does? <laughs> Do I know any? Um, I, I don't, but it doesn't mean that there isn't anyone. You know. you know, if you want, Mary Beth, if you join our group on Facebook, our private group that has 2,200 women, you guys, if anybody's not in it, you guys yeah. can feel free to I know, join the group. I, I know several really good surgeons in Chicago, um, and they're all conscientious. They do great work. Uh, I just can't speak as to whether they offer air asp or not, but you know, um, you know, I, I can give you some. Thank you. Yeah, no. Yeah, way. I'll, I would take uh, any any recommendations. Sure. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I, I, Thank you. Yeah, great guys and great guys in Chicago. That's great to hear. Thank you. And um, Tracy, can I can I just route that through you, or how yeah, how so would we get that information? Okay. If you want, send me a message, and then Dr. Chris, would you mind? I'm Dr. C. Would you mind sending me? Um, yeah, or you guys, you know, you can, uh, you know, through social media, you can DM me, whatever, you know. Okay. You, Great. You, you Thank you very much. You're welcome. I have a, a a question. I earlier, I you know, like I said earlier on the call, I had the latissimus dorsi flap where they they cut into my back, but I had a ton of complications. So for, you know, when I had my, I had to have a reduction first because I used to be like a double, triple D, like I had very large breasts. So they made me do a reduction first before I had my me. When I did the reduction in my left breast, my breast split open. And I had to wait and then do the mastectomy. And when they did my, my reconstruction in the same procedure, when they did that, there was a lot of complications during my surgery and they were only able to reconstruct one breast 
and put in an expander. The expander again very strange you know so some of the women to avoid those types of, of complications because it was you know I didn't really have good advice with this. yeah I mean like everything you know communication is so central to any relationship isn't it you know so unfortunately if you don't have that it makes it tough because, um, you know, if you have an issue, sometimes, you know, it can be that you're always behind the eight ball, you know? Um, well, you and, and, I mean, honestly, I think you're very talkative, very friendly. A lot of the times you talk to your oncologist, they do for a short amount of time, and the majority you're talking to a, a nurse.
people around me experts. And I did not for advising and not someone die. You know, that's just to be, you hear the word, word cancer and immediately you're thinking, this is a death sentence. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's the first thing that comes to your mind. There's a lot of fear involved in decision making. And I think a lot of surgeons, when they're communicating with you, it, it can all be very technical and they're not thinking about the psychology behind how we're feeling when we're making these decisions. This is a really important point that you're bringing up. And um, on, our, you know, from our part, there are a lot of, a lot of patients feel that the sense of urgency to get something done, to make a decision, to get something done, get the surgery done. Uh, a lot of that urgency comes from the medical team too. Right. So, and, and we have this conversation with some breast surgeons, right? So, I mean, we, we've got a, a group of breast surgeons that we work really, really super closely with. We've got other surgeons. That we the ones that we work with sometimes we don't not to do as many procedures as many of You want to book surgery. You want to be, you know, you you want to be thinking within six weeks. That's kind of very that that takes into account all diagnoses, and it's a very blanket general number. But what I'm saying is, it's not six days. You've got right. weeks, okay? So you you've got enough time to think about things. And and for some women, they they're not going to feel comfortable thinking about. I mean, specifically. It's okay to wait until everything else is done. If that's where your head is, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with a delayed reconstruction. Your cosmetic result won't be as good. But if you're okay with that, then that's fine. Take the pressure off. Cut yourself some slack, right? But you've got time to consider your options, find your options, and work out what's best for you. You really do. Thank you so much. You've been a lot of great information and I hope everybody on the call really learned a lot. I know it can be super overwhelming when you're making these decisions and um, we really appreciate your expertise and you taking the time to connect with us because it is a scary time and I know there's a few new, newly diagnosed people on the call and so it, it can be very overwhelming and you know you yeah. go a little Google crazy and you know. Sure. <laughs> Now you could do breast advocate. You don't have to worry about Google. <laughs> you could just no, so, download it. Yeah, listen, and breast advocate isn't there to replace your team, okay? It's just not. Um, it's there to give you access to all the information you need so you can go through it at your leisure as, and as many times as you want. There's a community on there too, so you can chat with other women. Awesome. Uh, you know, so uh, it, it's there to take the stress off, and and it's it's a, I'm I'm really proud of the people that helped me out with it. I got some great physicians on the team that, that supplied the content with me along with me, so it's really top notch content, um, and um, you know it's it's not no one's selling anything. So you got all the time you want to go through the options. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Dr. C, for coming on and sharing all the information tonight. Um, I, I'm so sorry. I just saw Rita had a question. She wanted to ask it really quick before we... Sure. I had her hand raised for a while. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. I was wondering, um, like, what's your Facebook? Because the only, only thing I have is the BRCA, um, the um, Instagram. That's the only one I have. So for my group, it's called BRCA Strong also. And it says, you're kind of beautiful. If you look at it, 
it's like a little pink logo because we have a public group and then we have a private group. Okay. Just and then for kind of, Dr. C. I'm kind of, I'm kind of beautiful. Huh? I'm kind of beautiful. It says, be your own kind of beautiful. Oh, <laughs> be your own okay. kind. Oh, okay. like the right it one. It's not like a little pink. It's not the pink and teal one. It's the pink one. Okay. 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 There's okay. just two of them. So we have a private group where only women are. And then we, we have physicians in there as well. And then we have our public group. So our private group is a safe place for women to go and ask questions, share, share their stories, see where you're from, know the different kind of procedures that are offered. So that's that's the private group. And if you friend me, but you have to friend me under Tracy, it's T-R-A-C-Y. And yeah. then you got it, Milgram. And Tracy, then your whole last name? It's, Milgram. Yep, Milgram. That's how you'll find me on Facebook. It's hyphenated. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So. And then I just I just saw on the chat someone asked about how do we find surgeons that are trained to do nerve reconstruction in our area. Um, the company that makes the nerve graphs that we use, uh, the company is called Axigen. If you go to resensation.com, there's a surgeon finder. Oh wow. Okay. What's it called? Resensation.com. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Well, and make sure you guys follow Dr. C on Prima Plastic, Plastic Surgery. You guys can see him on Facebook and on Instagram. Um, make sure you follow him. He posts all kinds of follow-up information, different details on different surgeries. I know, again, last week I did a repost on just, you know, what do you do after surgery? Do you need a memo? Do you need an MRI? So just always updated information and again knowledge is power and we really appreciate your time and coming on and look forward to having you in in the future welcome i enjoyed it hope it was helpful thank you so much it was incredibly helpful